All right, good afternoon, everyone. I think we're a couple minutes after the top of the hour, and I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time to discuss with Dr. Tuckman uh, about the wonderful things that she's doing. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Jeremiah Martin. I'm an Associate Director of Alumni Relations and a double alum of Loyola University Chicago. We're very excited to see alumni and friends from across the country, as well as ramblers that are joining us from around the world. I know we have a couple tuning in from Australia and in Europe, so we're very excited that you're here. It's our great pleasure to be able to, to present the inaugural, inaugural We Are Called presentation, and we are delighted at the opportunity to showcase some of the great work being done here at Loyola, as well as engage in a dialogue about how we're, we are called to make a change in our world. Before we get started today, I wanted to go over a few logistical items. First, as this is a webinar format, cameras, microphones, and the chat function have been disabled. We have set aside a brief period near the end of our time today as an opportunity to hear from our guests with any questions that you have or stories that you would like to share about your experience with sustainability. To do this, please utilize the Q&A button on your Zoom controls to submit your questions and stories. Finally, we will be recording today's discussion and we'll be able to share it out with everyone who was not able to join us today, as well as those of you that were. So if you missed anything, don't worry, you'll be able to see Dr. Tuckman's presentation again. I now have the pleasure of introducing our presenter. Dr. Tuckman is an accomplished environmental scientist, educator, and activist. As the founding dean of the School of Environmental Sustainability, Dr. Tuckman has helped Loyola to become one of the greenest schools in the nation. Since 2013, Loyola has hosted an annual, uh, annual climate, conference, climate change conference, excuse me, uh, attracting leaders from across the globe and providing a platform for students and professionals alike to engage with environmental activism. It is a great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Nancy Tuckman to share her passion for sustainability and the story of how she is called to solve the challenges of protecting our environment to ensure that we have a home for future ramblers. Dr. Tuckman, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jeremiah, and welcome everybody. It's a, it's a real privilege to be able to take an hour of your day. And some of you, it sounds like you might even be in the middle of the night. So thank you so much for joining us. And if you're alumni, um, I hope that you walk away from this presentation feeling that you have some bragging rights to um, Loyola's leadership in environmental sustainability. Um, so I've been asked to talk about sort of this 20 year project that has taken place at Loyola University Chicago. We're nowhere near done with this project. We still have a lot of work to do, but it has been uh, very much a privilege to work at a university that's so committed to the care for creation. Um, and so I wanna just give you sort of an overview of Loyola University's response to the environmental crisis. And I'll start with a um, little bit of a sort of a history, a, a chronologic um, series of events or a series of programs that were launched that have really helped move the university sustainability initiative forward. Um, a lot of the planning work um, began in the early 2000s. And in 2002, we really launched um, a formal plan for sustainability on our campuses, and we called it the um, Sustainability Initiative. It was primarily focused on the campus environmental footprint, so infrastructure, energy, waste, those kinds of things. But at the same time, we were trying to build into the curriculum more um, environmental issues work, more about environmental sustainability. So then in 2005, we launched a small center of excellence called the Center for Urban Environmental Research and Policy. And that actually was the seed that became the Institute of Environmental Sustainability in 2013. And then in 2020 became the School of Environmental Sustainability. So again, we've had this two-pronged approach where we, we are working on lowering our campus environmental footprint on all of our campuses of which there are several. You know, we have really five campuses in Chicago. If you include the main campus here at Lakeshore, the Water Tower campus, the Health Sciences campus, and then we have two small campuses, Cuneo in Vernon Hills, and then our Loyola University Retreat and Ecology Campus, which is out in Woodstock. So those five in the Chicago region, and then of course we have 
um, the Rome Center. And every one of the campuses has been built, you know, and, and modified and renovated using lots of new policies that we have about environmental sustainability. So that's a big ongoing initiative that involves the cabinet, the president, uh, a lot of finance, um, as well as huge commitment from facilities and Kena Henning has really been leading um, our partnership in uh, facilities and grounds. And then the second prong of the approach, of course, is the major wheelhouse of our organization, which is education and student uh, focused work, raising awareness, um, that kind of thing. So let's start with the campus environmental footprint, just sort of bring you up to speed with what's happened over the past 20 years. And then we'll move into what we're doing in the education realm. So we have been really um, diligently working on reducing Loyola University's environmental footprint since 20, uh, 2002, when the then university president, Michael Garanzini, made a pledge that you know, we, we had a lot of deferred maintenance and a lot of the buildings were old and needed to be replaced and renovated. And he made a pledge that every new building and all of the renovated buildings would uh, qualify for LEED certification, at least LEED Silver. So, you know, that's just the beginning of all the commitments. But in general, what we've been able to do is in, reduce our energy consumption by 40%. Now, keep in mind, that's when the university is building. So we went from a much lower enrollment and um, many fewer faculty and staff than we have today. So on a per capita basis, our energy reduction has been a little over 50%. Um, uh, one of our newest accomplishments is that 100% of our electricity on all four campuses, not including LUREC, because we're trying to go um, completely sustainable there with geothermal and um, and uh, you know other renewable sources. But um, on the four other campuses in Chicago, as of this past September, 100% of our electricity is coming from solar. So we're no lo longer using any fossil fuel or even nuclear-based uh, electricity. But you can see that we've just made a lot of accomplishments on conserving water and rainfall and supporting native biodiversity, um, diverting waste uh, and increasing recycling and composting. And then one thing that we're really excited about is the climate action plan that was ratified by the board that states that our campuses will be carbon neutral by 2025. We're almost there. We don't have that much farther to go. Um, but many of you know that it's those last few percentage points that are the hardest to get. So we continue to work on carbon neutrality. Here's some examples. I, I think, you know, this is just nine, these are just nine of the new buildings that have been built on our campuses in the Chicago area. Um, each one of these is uh, sort of a standalone um, uh, positive thing that the university has contributed to our carbon footprint. Uh, each one uniquely contributes to many of the different buckets of sustainability that we're working on. Um, but I think now we have over 14 LEED certified buildings and this is just sort of a snapshot of, of some of those new buildings. And just so that you understand our, our sustainability plan really truly is comprehensive. It goes way beyond our buildings. It includes policies that we have for our vendors that come onto campus and do various things for us, like our food vendors and our purchasing vendors. Um, we have pretty stringent Energy Star policies with them. Um, we also work a lot on our electronics, given that you know everybody has multiple devices now, not just one computer, but you know iPhones and iPads. We've done a lot of work. Um, on making sure that the um, hardware that the university purchases is hardware that has been sustainably um, produced and can also be sustainably decommissioned um, and decomposed and sorted out and reused and recycled. We work on reducing um, people driving single occupancy vehicles uh, to work every day. We do a lot around carpooling. We've um, increased electric vehicle infrastructure to encourage people to buy electric vehicles. 
all of our shuttle buses that go between our campuses are fueled using the biodiesel that our students produce out of the waste vegetable oil that, that comes from our campus cafeterias. So that's another kind of circular economy, closed loop, you know, reusing a waste product um, and diverting fossil fuel use. Um, I wanna show you some of our green roofs, which are really beautiful and they're well supported and they they really do support a lot of biodiversity. We see uh, a lot of pollinator species that come and utilize our green roofs. These are the ones on campus. Our faculty and students study them to see how well they uh, can keep our buildings cool, how much they support biodiversity, um, and how they kind of extend our green footprint, if you will, on our campuses. Um, we also capture all of our rainwater, which is which was a very expensive commitment and investment, but also a really important one because whenever it rains, it, we have a big rain in the Chicago region, there's so much cement that most of that rainwater goes into uh, the stormwater system, which when it gets overwhelmed is combined with the sewage system and all of that water combined stormwater and sewage water gets dumped into Lake Michigan. That happens about seven times per year. And it's not a problem unique to Chicago. It happens in you know, all of the big cities around the Great Lakes. So we can proudly say that Loyola University's 40 acre campuses do not contribute to that problem. We retain our own uh, rainwater in big underground cisterns that then slowly uh, release that rainwater back into the soil. The new um, School of Environmental Sustainability building is completely heated and cooled on a very massive uh, geothermal system, which you can see over here. It, this is kind of the, the building structure, but all of these wells, there are 91 of them, they go 500 feet down into the ground and they carry water and they basically utilize the ground that surrounds them as, as sort of an energy heat battery. <laughs> so they draw heat from the earth all winter long to, to warm our, this whole complex of buildings. And then also in the summer, when the air temperature is much warmer than the temperature down below ground, it sort of packs that heat from our air inside our buildings down underground and it brings up cool water that then cools our buildings. So it's a really terrific system, super energy efficient. And currently it's the largest geothermal system in the Chicago land area. Although we hope that Obama's new library building, which is thinking of building a geothermal system is even bigger. So, in general, um, we have been really uh, acknowledged as a climate leader. We won the National Climate Leadership Award for universities across the country by Second Nature, um, and that was in 2017. And we have continually been ranked in the top 5% of green campuses across the United States, and that's been in the last 10 years. So here are just an example of some of the awards that our university has been given over the years. Um, I think this is really exciting that our commitment to the environment has really um, been measurable. We've been able to really show how much waste we've reduced, how much stormwater we're capturing, how much energy we're reducing, and how few, um, what a small percentage of our energy consumption is now uh, based on fossil fuels, and that's just natural gas. So we're working on moving 100% off of fossil fuels by 2025. So What's most exciting is the interest that students, particularly Generation Z, the current entering students in universities, their interest in our commitment to the environment, it really attracts students. When we survey our incoming freshmen, over half of them say that Loyola's commitment to the environment was either important or very important to their decision to choose Loyola, because as you know, they get um, admitted to many different universities. And when they ultimately choose Loyola and we ask them why, this ends up being a very important 
um, component of who we are. So it attracts students. Um, Forbes in the end of 2019 did an international survey with Amnesty International. It was called the Future of Humanity Survey. And they interviewed Gen Z. And when they asked them, what are the most important issues that are facing the world and facing your country? The top issue was climate change. The second most important issue to them was pollution. Third was terrorism. And the fourth is loss of natural resources. So you can see how tuned in Generation Z is to the environmental crisis when three of the top four issues are really focused uh, directly on environmental degradation. Okay, so back to our two-pronged approach. I sort of walked you through what we're doing um, with our campus environmental footprint. And again, that's an ongoing process. We still have work to do and um, we feel like we have a really good community buy-in from the president all the way down to the students and also the board of trustees. So the whole community is really helping to reduce our environmental footprint. And now I wanna take you into the education side of the two-pronged approach, because this is really where we can raise awareness and help to develop the next generation of environmental leaders through our curriculum and through you know, sort of what we're teaching. So let me um, take you first to the School of Environmental Sustainability. We are a highly interdisciplinary school that has faculty from all of these different areas because we look at environmental science and environmental sustainability as being a very interdisciplinary, big, complex problem that requires people with expertise from all of these areas. Ecology, which is a, a part of uh, uh, a discipline, subdiscipline of biology that really focuses on natural ecosystems, their structure and function is kind of at the center. But then you have to bring in all these human um, aspects to really be able to get your head around environmental issues from an environmental science perspective. So as um, over the last few years, as we've, as we've been hiring faculty, you can see that we are now, we, we started with kind of a core group of scientists, and now we're bringing in faculty that have all of this other expertise in the social sciences and health and um, ethics, et cetera. So this is what our faculty currently looks like. And the um, probably the most important thing that we do as a School of Environmental Sustainability in the education uh, part of our work is that we provide an awareness and a certain degree of literacy around the environmental issues that are so pressing um, and so relevant in this particular um, period in history. So we, we offer the tier one science core course. This is the course that's required by all students who are not science majors. They all have to take a, a foundational a tier one science course and they all have to take a tier two science course. So the required science course is EMBS 101, which is foundations of environmental science and environmental issues. We talk about climate change, the loss of biodiversity. We talk about pollution, you know, the major threats to the environment. So all students that go through Loyola University should have an exposure to these issues and not say that nobody ever talked about them, you know, in, um, in any of their classes. And then of course, in the tier two, students um, pick a class, but um, we teach many of those courses and, and these are some of the topics that those include. So I think probably the most important thing that we do in terms of education is really have such a, an important presence in the university core curriculum because that really impacts students way outside of the School of Environmental Sustainability. In addition, of course, in our own school, we have developed several different degrees, both BS and BA degrees for undergrads. We've developed master's degrees. Now we're working on um, a PhD degree, a PhD program that we hope to launch within the next couple of years. In all of our teaching, we employ a pedagogy that's very hands-on and high impact solution-based learning. And we do this primarily because 
um, when students hear over and over again about how grim our future is if we don't get off of fossil fuels and if you know if we don't stop producing single use plastics etc it can be very anxiety provoking and very depressing so we have found that the best way to engage students in the absolute truth of the urgency of the problem yet not taking away all their hope is to get them engaged in solutions and have them help us build solutions that we then implement right on our own campus. And we can measure how their solutions have reduced our own environmental footprint. So it's very important to get students involved in, you know, how to grow food sustainably in an urban environment, or how do we ban the sale of bottled water on our campus because it, pollutes, it, it produces so much plastic. And here we are sitting right on Lake Michigan, which is one of the finest sources of fresh water, fresh drinking water on the planet. Um, and then how do we use some of the waste that we're producing, like the waste vegetable oil from our uh, deep fat fryers in all of our campus cafeterias. How do we recapture that from our waste stream, bring it back onto campus, make it into a fuel that can then offset the diesel, the fossil fuel based diesel that our shuttle buses are using. These are all the kinds of solutions that are incorporated into our curriculum and really enrich co-curricular um, activities for students as well. So the vision of growth for the School of Environmental Sustainability is that um, when we became a school and the uh, Board of Trustees ratified our proposal and our budget to become a school, this happened last year in 20, well, it happened in September of 2020, um, we proposed to double our faculty and staff from 30 people to 60 people in the next five years. We're now at 40. Uh, full-time faculty and staff, and we're hiring eight more people this year. So we're well on that um, trajectory of growth. But also, how do you take all of the expertise that we have in the big umbrella of environmental sustainability and define five or four of the most um, important and vexing problems that our faculty have expertise in? So we worked on that with our faculty and we developed these five affinity groups and you can see the big vexing complex audacious problems that our faculty are addressing. Um, so the loss of biodiversity is a really important one and we have a lot of faculty from all those different disciplines that you saw coming together around that issue. So we've got not just biologists who study plants and animals and ecosystem structure and function, but we've also got policy people and we've got um, economists who are looking at the major drivers of loss of biodiversity and how do we build policy and change our economic system so that it can support biodiversity. Same thing for these other issues that you, you can simply go down and read, but it's really exciting to bring together faculty from many different disciplines who are, are real experts in you know, these five big vexing problems and, and see the synergy of you know, their desire to really contribute to the curriculum and to the research knowledge and also to the applied research, the solutions that um, our country needs and our society needs in order to get us past this. I also just want to um, shine a little bit of a light on, you know, Loyola, Loyola's leadership because we have been out ahead um, compared to many universities since we've been at this for 20 years now. And so we've been called on by many of the American Jesuit College and Universities 27 North American Jesuit universities to help them develop their own environmental sustainability plans and, and to help them develop curricula around environmental sustainability and sort of helping them, uh, instead of reinventing the wheel at every university, sort of using the model and, and helping each school get there a little bit quicker. So these are just some of the universities that we've worked really closely with and it's been super gratifying to see each one of these really take off in their own way, um, in their own context, on building their environmental sustainability plans, both for their campus and for their curriculum. Uh, similarly, 
the um, International Association of Jesuit Universities, the IAJU, you know, the Jesuits are, uh, um, have the largest network of universities on the planet. And that's a lot of amazing resource to be able to leverage. And since Pope Francis is a Jesuit and his, um, he's really called us into action with Laudato Si, his encyclical, and also the Society of Jesus themselves have developed their own sort of strategic plan, if you will, that has four main goals and they're called universal apostolic preferences. Well, one of those is accompanying youth to a hope-filled future, which is really what we're trying to do with um, saving the planet so that there is a hope-filled future for our youth. And then of course, um, their fourth universal, universal apostolic preference is care for our common home, which means you know, caring for creation, caring for the planet, um, and caring for the, the common home that we all live in. So um, with this kind of leadership, the International Association of Jesuit Universities are all moving towards trying to advance Pope Francis's Laudato Si, as well as advancing the Society of Jesus's um, universal apostolic preferences. So we've been, I would say Loyola has been a leader and been instrumental in helping organizations, universities around the world that haven't yet started or are just getting started and sort of need a way forward um, and, and need some help in moving forward. Um, and then finally, the, the Pope, Pope Francis, you know, his encyclical Laudato Si was launched about six years ago now, and um, on the fifth year anniversary of Laudato Si, which called, you know, all people to, to really live more simply and reduce their environmental impact on the planet, he is now implementing a seven-year challenge, which is calling all people around the world, um, he says all people of goodwill should be involved in building your own plan and making your own journey. So he's asking people to make a pledge. He's asking organizations from families to parishes to um, schools and then universities and businesses and hospitals. He's talking about all levels of organization in our society need to make a pledge to join this seven year environmental challenge. And the idea is no matter what your context is, what your starting point is, you need to really make a pledge so that in the seven, next seven years, you will get closer to you know, carbon neutrality, zero waste, all of those really aspirational goals that we set um, for helping, uh, helping the planet. So Loyola and our faculty have been um, invited by the Pope to serve as the leaders of the working group for universities, all Catholic universities around the world. So um, one of our faculty has been leading this effort now for about a year and a half, and they've developed um, a roadmap that they call Pathways. It's a roadmap for universities to get on this journey, and it, it allows people and universities from no, whatever your context is, it could be a very poor, low-resource university um, in, in a developing country that hasn't been able to put any resources into environmental sustainability. They've developed, the, the working group has developed a way for those universities to engage and develop their own seven-year plan. And then also universities like Loyola that have been working on this and, and made tremendous commitments for the past 20 years. Um, there's certainly more work than we can, that we can do as well. So anyway, it's just exciting that Loyola is seen as a leader on um, the international platform and that we keep getting invited to you know, help um, work with other universities to help them build their own, um, their own journeys. And uh, that's a really exciting thing, especially when Pope Francis invites you to do that. So I just want to conclude my talk here because I would love to hear from you. Um, and a lot of people ask, you know, what can I do? What can I do to help? I mean, this does seem like such a big impossible 
problem and how can any individual make a difference? But the individual does make a big difference and everybody has to put effort forward and thought into how am I going to reduce my environmental footprint, both in my family and at my home and also at my workplace? How can I lead by example in the places where, in the circles where I um, work and play? Um, and even if what you're doing is starting with, you know, composting food waste, that makes a difference because it gets your mind thinking about waste. It gets your mind thinking about the plastic that you just, you know, purchased or used one time and now are throwing away. You, it, it gets you into this mindset of being responsible um, rather than kind of waiting for a big top down answer that we think is going to swoop in from, I don't know, from government or from engineers, but that there's no one single bullet that's the silver bullet that's going to solve this problem and we need all hands on deck and everybody has to start from whatever your context is and you have to do better and you have to do more i i really feel like um that's very very important and of course um supporting some of the excellent organizations environmental organizations that are already fighting these battles and making tremendous differences, you know, World Wildlife Fund or the Sierra Club or Natural Resources Defense Council, um, 350.org, you know, you name it. There's so many really important and valuable organizations that are already doing this work and they could use your support either as a volunteer or a member of, and paying dues. Um, that's really important. And then of course, understanding the people that you're voting for locally and uh, regionally as well as nationally and what their position is on um, the environment I think is another really important thing. How, if you're interested in supporting Loyola and the School of Environmental Sustainability or your alma mater um, university and the work that we're doing and, and committed to around the environment, um, you might participate in some of our events like the annual climate change conference, which is coming up the week of March 14th through the 18th. Um, if, you're, if you have the capacity and you're interested, you might volunteer to work with our students. Um, our students love to work with alumni. And if any alumni are doing things in your business or in your workplace or at your home, that um, you could inform our students about or vice versa. If you wanna bring students in who know how to build, who know how to assess your own environmental footprint um, and help you get started, you know, it could go in both directions. And I just think that's a really exciting possibility for partnership. And then, you know, if you have a um, financial capacity to give to our scholarship funds um, and our sustainability funds, it really helps us to make bigger commitments and bigger strides towards improving and, and making our campus a net zero campus. But also the scholarships are so important, especially for us to reach underrepresented communities, students of color, um, students who may not be able to afford to go to a private school like Loyola, but they really wanna be part of the solution to our environmental crisis. So these are just ways that um, you might be involved with Loyola. And I'm going to stop sharing now and, and come back to the bigger screen and um, would really love to entertain any comments or questions or concerns that, that you have as an audience. So I think Jeremy or Jeremiah is going to be looking at um, anything that you're posting in the question and answer. So feel free to write anything in there. Absolutely. So first of all, thank you so much, Dr. Tuckman. Um, I have had the opportunity to work with you a number of times. And every time I hear you talk about this, the, the passion that you have is palpable. And, and I really have a lot of hope for how we can continue to move forward and make strides. Um, I do want to remind all of our guests here, if you have any questions or want to share a story about how you've engaged with environmental sustainability, please feel free to put it in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, we want this time to engage in a dialogue with Dr. Tuckman. Um, we have had a couple come in already. Um, and so Dr. Tuckman, you talked about the work that we do in our biodiesel lab and how we link up with our cafeterias um, and how that really goes into a closed loop system. Can you talk if there's a plan of expanding that across Catholic schools 
uh, here in the United States, or if there's any plan to make kind of that, that food process a little bit more sustainable um, across Catholic education. You know, that's, it's really such an important thing because food, believe it or not, ends up, you know, our, our agriculture system, um, our sort of industrial agriculture system in this country is the largest contributor to the loss of biodiversity. And it's also the largest contributor to, to our nitrogen and phosphorus pollution in the Great Lakes, as well as um, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and thirdly, it's the largest contributor to greenhouse gases, which is a surprise to many people. And then in addition, that's just on the front end of the food system, on the back end of the food system, we produce so much wasted food. And much of that food, because it's organic it, and it ends up in the landfill, it will decompose in the landfill um, anaerobically because it's not exposed to air and oxygen. And then it's releasing methane when it decomposes. And methane, of course, is a very potent greenhouse gas. And so there's a lot of evils that we have in our food system because it's just not very efficient. So um, cafeterias in Catholic schools, in, in all, you know, in all elementary public and Catholic and all elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, and universities, that is a very important um, area for us to work on. What we find is that um, most schools bring in um, a company, an external food service mm -hmm. that does all of their food and you know, prepares the food and brings it in. Um, and then there are people that are employed at the school that will serve the food. But um, it's those companies that we have to work with because they buy the cheapest stuff that has the biggest environmental footprint. And um, the, the cheaper the food is, the more food that schools can serve to students, which means there's more waste. Um, it's also, so, so that's one really important way, I think, to approach the, the food system problem in our schools. But secondly, um, the, the food waste end of it is a, a bit of a challenge for schools because if they want to compost that food, um, they either have to have space on their campus and an employee that can actually make a big compost um, area where they can produce compost and then maybe use it on their own grounds. That's very unusual for a school to have the funding to be able to do that. So oftentimes they will hire um, a waste pickup uh, consultant or a waste pickup organization that will pick up their food waste, but it has to be sorted, of course, at, at the um, location. And then they'll haul that off to a, um, a more industrial composting site. Um, both of those are really good ways to deal with your compost, but it does require some infrastructure changes at the school and it requires space and, um, you know, usually some staff. So that those tend to be the the really um, bottle the bottlenecks I think for schools. But I would say if we can get our food services companies to build a comprehensive you know contract with schools where they deliver the food and they pick up the waste, it gets them to think more about a circular economy. And after all, we. We are the customers, so we ought to be able to get them thinking more about that. So I, I'll just say that we've worked for years with Aramark, who is Loyola's uh, food primary food service company, and um, it's it's taken probably 20 years to get Aramark to really start thinking about this kind of thing and really change their model. Well, as long as we're moving in the right direction, hopefully, you know, we can inspire them to move a little bit faster. Um, <laughs> On a, on a little bit more local level, uh, we had an alum, Bobby, ask if you had a brand of in-home compost that you recommend. I know a lot of people are passionate about getting started at, at composting at home. Uh, so I guess if you don't have a brand recommendation, what are some steps that people can take to starting that process at their home? You know, it can be overwhelming. And I'll tell you a shortcut that you can take that I think works with home composting. And it's a little tricky if you live in a, a building, for example, and you don't have a yard or a garage. Um, 
you probably have to work within the homeowners association of your building. Um, but if you have even a small little yard um, or even a porch <laughs> that's outdoors, what you can do is if you collect in a small bucket with a lid on it in your kitchen, you can take all your kitchen scraps out, just take it out to a, a regular big plastic garbage bin that has a lid. And if you put your kitchen scraps in there and then layer it with leaf litter that you may have collected from last fall, if you have a bag of leaf litter and you do that um, layering of wet nitrogen rich food waste with dry carbon rich landscape waste, it can also be dried grasses and things like that probably not twigs because the wood doesn't decompose very quickly. But if you keep layering like that, you can do that all winter long. And then when it comes to spring, if you can spread that out in a little spot in your garden and let the water drain and let it um, get a little bit of air, just turn it you know, once a week or just get in there with a rake and push it around a little bit you'll find that within pretty short order over the period of the summer, you're gonna have some pretty nice, rich, dark stuff that you can then integrate into your gardens. Um, you don't have to be perfect about it. You don't have to you know, measure the carbon to nitrogen ratio, but you usually have pretty luck, good luck if you use equal parts of kitchen scrap wastes um, with uh, equal parts of, of dried yard landscaping waste. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and as a personal anecdote, growing up as someone who composted, if you're getting into composting, be prepared. You may find some surprise growth. Uh, we composted some pumpkins and had the largest pumpkins we ever had the <laughs> following season. So uh, just, just be ready for that. Uh, We've had a, a number of excellent questions that have come in, and I don't know that we'll have time to get to all of them. Um, but we had an alum, Michael, asked a, a really great question here. He says, those of us over 60 grew up in such a different environmental awareness or lack thereof than our current university students. From your experience with these young people, what do you think is the most important thing that they can teach us about the environment? Um, I, I feel as though we 60 year olds need to lead by example because Generation Z students who are, you know, 18 to 25 are really scared. And the burden is on them. They're terrified of what's happening to our environment and seeing it, you know, hitting home, close to home. Um, <clears throat> they are developing anxiety, climate anxiety, and climate depression. So, we should pay attention to that. That's what we can learn from them is what has happened <laughs> because of our neglect or just that we weren't tuned into it, um, what's happened and now what they're dealing with. And, and a lot of people in their 20s are getting married and not wanting to have kids because they look at the world that their kids are gonna grow up in and it's just, it's just very terrifying. So I think we have to be very, very in tune to that. And then we can't say, I, I hope that you will never say, we're so happy that your generation came along because you really get it and you're really tuned into it. So we know that you're gonna you know, lead us out of this problem. There's not enough time for these teenagers and early twenties um, people to develop the, the knowledge and skills and work experience, the networks, the money that's needed in immediately to get us off of fossil fuels. We basically have a very short window and it's this decade. We have to be 100% off of fossil fuels by 2030 or we're never gonna even come close to meeting the 1.5 degrees Celsius increase in global warming. And if we don't meet that, then we're going to be in a constant state of emergency with, you know, typhoons and um, big hurricanes and tornadoes and, you know, wildfires and all that. It's just going to be constantly being barraged by that. And all of our money is going to be in this emergency cleanup. Um, 
what we want our money to go into is improvement and new jobs and education and healthcare. Not all this other, you know, dis it's almost like being in a war where all your effort is going to go into this war that we're, we've waged on the planet. So I think what we need to do is pay attention to the concerns that the youth have, but then we have to put our shoulders into it because we're the ones that have accrued wealth and we have big networks and we have a lot of leverage buttons that we can lever to help us get to a just transition to a clean energy economy. And we have to do it now, which is why I'm suggesting that you know, support some of these organizations that are really well designed and they're doing this good work rather than, you know, trying to ask the 18, 19, 20 year olds to get out there and, you know, do it themselves. Um, we can learn from them that this is an urgent issue and we can learn from them that they want us to mobilize. They want us to act. They want to see action in the right direction. And that's what gives them hope that, what, that is what gives them this sense of maybe there is a chance and maybe I can have kids. Yeah. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. I think we have time for about one more. Um, and we, to tie it back to, to Loyola specifically and, and kind of improving the things that we can here on campus, uh, Father Tom Metzke from the uh, Rube College Ask the question, well, he starts off, he says, I'm very proud of all of the work. You have taken the Jesuit values to heart and challenged all of us to live more authentically. He then goes on to ask, if money were not an object, what would be your next big project for our campuses? How can we move forward and continue this work um, and, and continue to see a growth in sustainability? Thank you for that comment, Father Tom. And um, I just want to kind of reflect that back on the Jesuits. You know, I wasn't raised as a Catholic and I didn't go to any Catholic or Jesuit schools in all of my training. And I came to Loyola kind of naively, not really knowing much about the Jesuits. But I came here almost 30 years ago. And when I learned about the mission, I was just so excited to be part of something much bigger than just sort of teaching, doing research and building my CV, if, if you will that I, I sort of drank the Jesuit Kool-Aid as I'm sure a lot of people um, you know, that are participating in this webinar have done the same. And you really feel like you're part of something bigger and more important when you're um, a part of the Society of Jesus. So it's, it's a wonderful thing that the Jesuits are leading this kind of mission-based important justice work and that you invite you know, lay people like myself to be a part of it. And you, you welcome participation from um, those of us who call ourselves Jesuit colleagues. So I, I'm sure so many people who are participating feel that way as well, or else you wouldn't probably be reconnecting or, you know, staying connected with your alma mater. Um, you know, if I had all the money in the world, I would, I would get us 100% off of fossil fuels because, um, natural gas is going to be a bugger and it's really there's so much infrastructure you know think about our how we heat our hot water um it, and how we use natural gas on our campus it's so tricky to have to you know tear out all that old infrastructure and put in new infrastructure so that costs a lot of money but i wish we could do that and i also wish that we could get um all of our vehicles um, you know, not just on our campuses, but in our city and in our whole country off of gasoline, um, off of fossil fuel based gasoline and diesel. Um, and that's a big infrastructure change as well, isn't it? I mean, think of just all the gas stations <laughs> around our whole country, almost every corner has a gas station. And so to have to change that to sort of like maybe an electric charging station or um, just build vehicles that are not running on gasoline that don't have greenhouse gas emission. That's really, um, we have the technology. Um, we don't really have the will. We have a lot of pushback, especially from the fossil fuel industry and people who are um, invested in that, you know, that don't, don't want to make that change. But maybe if we could throw all the money in the world at it, it, it would make a difference. 
Absolutely. Well, and, and our alums can directly support you and your work. Um, before we sign off today, I wanted to see if you would be able to share the dates for the Climate Change Conference again and, and how people can get involved in that. Sure. And maybe you can put this in the chat. Um, the dates of the Climate Change Conference are March 14th through the 18th. It's a week long kind of series of events. And you'll see that we're going to have a, an opening keynote event um, on the theme of climate change, human health, and justice, the intersection of those three things. How does climate change impact human health, including COVID, which by the way is environmentally, dis is caused by environmental destruction and humans interaction with uh, wildlife. Um, so how does climate change intersect with human health and justice? So those three things. So what we've done is have, we have an opening keynote on Tuesday night, the 15th, um, and then a closing keynote on Thursday night, the 17th, and the closing keynote should be interesting. We're having Governor Pritzker and several of our representatives in the state of Illinois talk about um, the recent legislation that they've passed on clean energy, the clean energy bill, how we're going to move Illinois off of fossil fuels, and how the plan for the state of Illinois and what we're, we're already implementing is moving us into the climate leadership um, category of states across the country. Now we're never going to catch up to, to California, but then um, Colorado is doing pretty well as well. But we were laggards, you know, we, us Midwesterners are you know, we've been on coal for so many years. Um, mm -hmm. It takes a while to make that transition, but now it seems like um, the pedals to the metal and we're really moving quickly towards a just transition and that's super exciting. So you'll see that in between those keynotes, there are lots of events that other centers around the university are hosting. Mm -hmm. So for example, the Center for Catholic Intellectual Heritage is hosting an event under this theme of the intersection of climate change, human health and justice through the Catholic lens. So that's a kind of a cool um, uh, piece to look at. And then we've got the Parkinson School of Health Science and Public Health. They're sponsoring a couple of events that are really looking at it through the lens of public health. Um, we've got CURL, the Center for Urban Research and Learning is doing one really looking at the, the Chicago South Side and kind of justice issues and the Baumhart um, Center, which comes from our Quinlan School of Business, is looking at some African American entrepreneurs um, in Chicago who are doing some really cool green sustainable businesses. So I think there's sort of a lot a lot of exciting um, events happening. If you go to the website luc.edu backslash climate change, all one word, luc.edu backslash climate change, you'll see a registration button and the agenda of all these various events. You can sign up for them, it's free. Um, you can sponsor the climate change conference if you're so moved to do. Um, we're bringing in a lot of speakers who require big honorariums. So we also um, appreciate any financial support that you can give us. But I think it's a good way to bring our community together and um, raise awareness about these climate change issues and then call people to action. Absolutely. Well, we'll be sure to link the climate change website in the email that goes out following, thanking all of our attendees. Um, Dr. Tuckman, we are running out of time, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for taking the time to address our alumni and our community today. As I've mentioned, every time I get to hear you speak, it, it truly is a privilege and your passion is, is so infectious to everyone that you talk to. So thank you for taking the time today. Well, uh, thank you for the invitation. I, absolutely, absolutely. I also wanted to thank all of our attendees for attending the presentation today. I hope that um, you learned something from Dr. Tuckman. I know that I definitely did. We invite you obviously to the Climate Change Conference in March, um, but we will be continuing these We Are Called conversations across a variety of disciplines here in the uh, Loyola University community. Our next one will be on February 16th, and it is a look at student life throughout Loyola's 150 year history. So we hope that you will join us for that. Thank you everyone for joining us today and go Ramblers. <laughs> Bye.